Hello students, I am Pratik Bhaseen and today we will be studying about the third chapter from your NCRT booklet that is money and banking. So what is money? Money is the most important thing that revolves around us. It is the single most commodity after which we all are running. Be it your parents, let me take my example. I am also running after money. This is because I need to fulfill my wants. So after this chapter, you will be able to learn about what is money, what are its function and how did it come into existence. So let's talk about medieval centuries. What happened was there was no single unit of exchange. So people were indulging into barter system. You will wonder what is barter system. So barter system was a system where people directly exchanged goods against goods without the use of money because there was no money. So imagine a village where there are many people and who want to satisfy their wants. Now to satisfy their wants they have to give up something in order to consume a commodity. So let's suppose a farmer who grows rice wants wheat. He goes to a person or a farmer who is growing the other commodity. He asks can you give me that other commodity? He says, what will you return me in exchange? He says, what do you want? Let's suppose he asks for leather. But the first farmer says that I don't have leather in exchange. Now this will cause a problem because it won't result in an exchange. Now what to do? So barter system as I already told you was direct exchange of goods against goods without the use of money resulted in a major problem that is problem of double coincidence of wants. Now it was important, it was required that we need to cover this problem. So money was introduced. Now what is money? Money is a medium of exchange and it is generally used as in repayment of debt. That means by using money you can buy any commodity in any quantity, whatever you want. Under barter system, we also faced one more problem, that is the problem of common measure of value. What happened was, it was very difficult to measure the value of a commodity in terms of other commodity. Let's suppose there are 10 commodities. Now every commodity can be measured in each other's term. So we'll have 100 exchange ratios. It is not possible to everybody to remember or recognize 100 exchange ratios. So what do we do? So we had to introduce a common measure of value so that every item can be exchanged for that one common measure of value that was money. Under barter system we also faced one more problem that was the problem of store of value. Let's suppose I'm a farmer. I have huge quantities of wheat. Enough to fulfill my consumption and even after that I have loads of wheat lying in my go down. Now what happens? I'll exchange the wheat for my consumption and the extra wheat that I am left with will keep it for myself. It was very difficult to store wealth in the form of commodities because commodities were prone to decay or destruction. Let's take an example of a rich farmer who has a huge quantity of wheat with himself. Let's suppose he uses a part of wheat for his own consumption needs, exchanges some part of it for other commodities and now he is left with a huge quantity of wheat. What does he do? He has nothing to do with that. Now suppose if he keeps that part of wheat with himself, it will decay after a certain period of time. So he won't be left with any wealth. Now what does he do? He may store his wealth in the form of gold, silver or any other commodity but none of them is as liquid as money. By liquid I mean that it can be converted into any other commodity. With what ease one commodity can be converted into any other commodity. Now suppose we want to convert wheat into any other commodity it will be difficult. But suppose if I want to convert my money into any commodity, it can be converted. So from here we come to the third function of money that is money serves as a store of value. 
that means you can store your wealth in the form of money as it is the most liquid asset available in recent terms. What happens is when you want to convert money into any other commodity, it converts with ease and also without any value deduction. Now let's suppose you want to convert your gold into money. There will be some value deduction by the jeweler or from the bank from which you have purchased that gold bullion. So money is the most liquid asset. As liquids have a property that they tend to take the shape of the container, same goes with money. That money can be converted into any and every commodity. You name it and money will buy it. Now we come to the fourth problem that was faced in the barter system. It was problem of standard of deferred payment. What happened was that under barter system, it was difficult to make payments in future. That is, there was no standard of loans and investment transactions. Now let's suppose under barter system, I borrow 1 kg rice from you. Now what do I return and when do I return? Let's suppose we agree on a time period of 1 year. Now what value should I return? The most probable answer from your side would be, sir return 1 kilograms of rice, you have taken 1 kilogram. But students, it will cause a loss. It's because, let's suppose I borrow 10,000 rupees from you, will you be in a position after one year to take back 10,000? You won't. You will say, sir, what is the interest that I'll be getting from that 10,000? I say, what interest do you want? Why do you want the interest? You say, sir, interest is a compensation for delayed consumption. That is, I had given you 10,000 rupees. I could have used that 10,000 rupees to buy things, I would have consumed them and got satisfaction from it. But because you came and you asked for rupees 10,000, I gave it to you. So I delayed my consumption because you wanted money and so I was delayed by my satisfaction. So I had waited to buy a new bike, I had waited to buy a new dress what compensation do I get? I say, oh, so you need the compensation for delayed consumption. Similarly, in the previous time, what happened was that when I borrowed wheat and returned you the same quantity of wheat, it would lead you to a loss. So we'll have to decide what extra quantity should I return you back so you are compensated for your delayed consumption it was very difficult to decide because many commodities were being borrowed and many commodities were being lent. It was not possible to determine the interest of each and every commodity. Let's suppose I borrow an egg from you. Now, what amount of eggs should I return you after two days? What amount should be returned after five days? What amount of eggs should be returned after one month or one year? It is very difficult to calculate. Let's suppose I'm a farmer and I have no cattle to graze my field. I borrow your cattle for one month. What amount of cattle do I return you after one month? It won't be possible to increase the size of cattle in one month. So it caused a problem of standard of deferred payment. But on the other side of the coin, money served as a standard of deferred payment. It helped me to make transactions for the future repayment like loans and investment. If money wouldn't have been introduced, we wouldn't have been able to make transactions of loans and investments. So I hope you would have got an idea what was money, why was it introduced and what are the functions of money. Let's enlist them. So let's quickly recap the functions of money. First, we'll study about primary functions of money that were medium of exchange, the second one was unit of value or common measure of value. These two functions of money come under primary functions of money. The secondary functions of money include store of value and standard of deferred payment. So this was all about money. So students, now let us move to the next phase of the chapter that is banking. You must have heard about banks. 
what do banks do who heads these banks how is the banking activity controlled in our economy so let's discuss that in detail but before that let us discuss what banking is banking is an activity of inviting deposits from the public for the purpose of giving loans or making investments the deposits should be repayable on demand or otherwise by check draft or otherwise now if we see this definition we come to a conclusion that banks are engaged in an activity of asking the public to deposit their surplus funds with the banks now what will banks do with these surplus funds bank will use these funds to make investments or lend this money to the others in the economy now can the depositors withdraw their money it may be a yes or a no because if people have made demand deposits with the bank which means that these are those deposits which can be withdrawable on demand whenever the depositor demands it can withdraw that money back or otherwise means that some people also deposit fixed amount for a certain time period that is generally known as fixed deposit or time deposits these deposits carry a higher rate of interest and these are made for a longer period of time so a bank is an institution which invites the public to make deposits with bank and the bank may use that fund for making loans or investments and can repay that money on demand or otherwise so banking is merely an activity bank is the institution which indulges into that activity the monetary structure of india is a pyramid shape structure where the topmost position is occupied by our central bank which is reserve bank of india and the rest banks serve as an agent to the central bank they fulfill the monetary requirements of our economy so now let us understand what is the difference between a central bank and commercial bank as i already discussed that central bank is the apex institution which heads the monetary structure of an economy whereby commercial banks are banks which serve as the agent of the central bank they fulfill the monetary requirements of the economy if we talk about central bank it has the authority to issue currency but on the other hand commercial banks are not privileged enough to have this authority only central bank can print currency central bank works with a motive of social welfare it has no profit aspiration but on the other hand commercial banks have aspirations of profits they want to earn money because they are dealing with the public and want to earn themselves a handsome amount on the other hand central bank does not deal directly with the public you may have no person around who may say that i have an account in central bank that is a laughable notion similarly when we talk about central bank it frames the monetary policy of the country now what is monetary policy monetary policy is the policy which is framed by the central bank to control inflation and deflation similarly commercial banks do not frame any monetary policy they are merely regulated by the monetary policy made by the central bank now if we talk about central bank it also holds the forex reserves of our nation whatever forex reserves that our nation holds officially is held by the central bank but on the other hand commercial banks hold foreign exchange only for trading purposes it is not the official forex reserve for a nation so now let us move on to the functions of the central bank central bank being an the most important bank in the economy plays some functions the first function is it issues currency it has monopoly rights to issue currency why are central banks given these monopoly rights 
This is because of two main reasons. One, it creates a uniformity of the currency in the economy. So if you pick up a currency note from 2016 worth rupees 2000 and a currency note from 2020 worth rupees 2000, it will look exactly same. But on the other hand, if you pick up a check of ICICI Bank from 2016 and a check from HDFC Bank from the same year, it won't look same. So because the currency note is only printed by Reserve Bank of India, that is a central bank, it creates a uniformity of currency. The second reason why the monopoly rights are given to the central bank is because it is easier for the central bank to maintain the control over money supply. Because there is a single authority which is printing currency, so money supply can be easily controlled. So when we talk about monopoly rights of issuing currency, we also talk about that the currency issued by central bank is legal tender. Now what do you mean by legal tender? Legal tender money is a money which is officially declared by the government to act as money. And the most important thing, it is backed by assets of equal value. Backing by assets of equal value means that your currency note is guaranteed by the Reserve Bank of India to serve as fully as its face value. So suppose if you have a currency note of rupees 2000, it will give you the value of 2000. This notion is guaranteed by the central bank. You must have seen a currency note under which it is written that this currency is issued by Reserve Bank of India and it is guaranteed by the central government. You must have written uh, seen the note that the governor signs that note and he says that I promise to pay the bearer a sum of rupees 2000. So legal tender means that piece of paper is guaranteed to serve its face value. So the second function of central bank is it serves as a banker, agent and advisor to the government. As a banker to the government, it plays the same role as commercial banks play for their customers. So let's suppose I deposit my money into ICICI bank, the government does the same with RBI. That is, it can deposit its surplus funds with the RBI. Similarly, if I want some loan because I'm short of cash, I can go to ICICI bank and ask it for money. Similarly, when government faces deficits, it can also ask the central bank to extend some loans so it can cover its expenditures. Similarly, as an advisor, the government is also worried about inflation and deflation in the economy. It tries to make a balance of purchasing power in the economy because excess and deficit purchasing power both are harmful for the economy. So the central bank advises the government that how must the fiscal policy be framed in line with the monetary policy made by the central bank. Similarly, as an agent, the central bank also represents the government in international financial conferences. It also collects and makes payment on behalf of the government on its foreign loans outstanding. Now, let's suppose if India has borrowed some money from IMF, so who is going to make the payment? So this responsibility is entrusted to the Central Bank of India to make the payment of principal and interest on time. Now the third function, bankers, bank and supervisor. Everybody needs a bank. Same goes with our banks. That is ICICI Bank, SDFC Bank, SBI, PNB. All these banks also need a bank to serve them. Now, what do you mean by banker's bank? So let's suppose I deposit my money with a certain private bank and I withdraw from there whenever I'm in need. Similarly, when these banks are also flooded with money, they deposit their money with the central bank. Similarly, whenever any bank is short of money, it can borrow it from the RBI. As a supervisor, the central bank also audits these banks. That is, it carries out regular inspection at these banks that are they functioning properly or are they violating some norms. 
So the third function says that Central Bank of India serves as a banker's bank and supervisor in the economy, lender of last resort. This is the fourth function of Central Bank. Let me quote a line in Hindi. Akri Same Ka Masiha. The central bank serves as a lender of last resort. That is, whenever the banks in the economy, that is the commercial banks in the economy, face financial difficulties, they always have the central bank to look upon. They can always fall back upon the central bank for help. So how does central bank helps? Central bank always charges a certain portion of the commercial bank's deposit to be committed to the central bank. That is known as CRR which stands for cash reserve ratio. All the commercial banks have to deposit some part of their total deposits with the central bank. This is known as cash reserve ratio. No interest is paid to the banks on this and these deposits are not withdrawable until and unless the central bank allows it. Now central bank uses these deposits when commercial bank faces financial difficulties. So let's suppose a certain commercial bank faces financial difficulties. It can go to the central bank and ask for some loans. The central bank will readily help the commercial bank because it wants to maintain a monetary discipline in the economy. Now let's move on to the next function of the central bank, which is the settlement function or clearing house function. Have you ever noticed that what happens when you deposit a check in your account and how does the money gets credited? I'll tell you. Let's suppose I deposit a check received to me by a student and I deposit it into my account. The check gets credited, that is the amount is received after three days. So what mechanism is undertaken in these three days? The mechanism is that when I drop a check into my bank, it confirms that check from the bank of the person who has given me that check and ask him that is it a genuine check? Has the person maintained appropriate amount in his account? If yes, the check will get credited. This is known as settlement function or clearing house function. The same thing happens for banks. Let's suppose two banks have engaged into a transaction of lendings and borrowings. Let's suppose State Bank of India has lent money to Punjab National Bank and now Punjab National Bank wants to return it. So how will they do this transaction? So the transaction will be undertaken through the route of central bank that is the RBI. That is PNB will issue a check or draft to SBI and SBI will deposit that check or draft with Reserve Bank of India. And now the same process will be followed and the check will be cleared if appropriate amount is maintained by Punjab National Bank. The next function is controller of credit. It is very important to control credit into the economy because excess credit or deficient credit are always harmful for the economy. Excess credit leads to the problem of inflation. Similarly, deficit credit leads to the problem of deflation. So our central bank uses various quantitative and qualitative tools to control the amount of credit available in the economy. So students, I hope you would have understood what is money, why was it introduced, what are the functions of money, what is bank, what is banking and what are the two most important types of bank in our country that is central bank and commercial bank. You would have understood their difference and now we had discussed their functions of central bank which I have already summed up. I hope you would have understood this.